Tonight, what's working and what's not. Despite 10 million job openings in America, a million more people said they're not looking for work. What's a business owner to do? And a stabbing spree in New Zealand, the prime minister calling it terrorism. With two ISIS-inspired attacks in the last week, do Americans need to be on alert? And 9-11 families fight for answers and get them. President Biden ordered the release of key documents related to the 9-11 attacks. The Donlin Report starts now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Adrian Banker. Joe Donlin is off tonight. We've got some big news for you. You deserve a raise. That's right. Companies all across the country are offering higher pay to attract and keep workers. Announcing pay hikes recently, Walmart, Walgreens, PNC Bank. And in this tight labor market, Walmart says that more than half a million workers will earn more. The CEO of Walgreens putting it this way, raising pay is highly important to retaining and attracting a talented workforce. In other words, if you want a job, companies really want you and they're going to pay you more for it. So the number of new hires in today's national job support doesn't quite reflect that. The U.S. added 235,000 jobs last month. It really sounds good. However, economists were forecasting around 720,000 jobs filled. Meanwhile, the number of Americans who don't have a job and want one has dropped dramatically. Some are getting hired. But reading further into that, many people have decided they don't want to go back to work. In fact, half of all small businesses need employees, while 91% of small business owners say they got few or no qualified applicants. No doubt the pandemic has had an effect, but there's something else going on. With wages being up, companies hiring, and workers in America still saying no thanks. And so that's where we begin tonight. We are so grateful to have U.S. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh with us. Mr. Secretary, thanks so much for joining us. Let's get right to the chase. Talk to me like a guy who's been mayor of a city, a major city in the U.S., Boston, a guy who's been a labor union leader. Why did the jobs report disappoint? Why are so many Americans turning away from work? Well, you know, when, when I look at this jobs report, I, I don't necessarily characterize it as over disappointing, but I do characterize it as concerning. So when I say that, a couple of positives in the jobs report, 203,000 of these jobs were in the private sector. Uh, and when we saw an increase in manufacturing and, 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 and in auto parts, the, the, the downside is over the last three months, we saw huge growth, big growth in hospitality, leisure and hotel and, and, and uh, restaurants. This month, we saw zero growth. So what we, what we talked about this morning and what we're figuring out all day today, a large part of this is due, connected to the Delta variant and the concerns around the Delta variant. I think that that's one of the reasons why this, this report wasn't bigger. Uh, certainly, um, you know, last month we had a million jobs, uh, but, but last month we had a, huge, a big number in hospitality. So, you know, we, it, when you think about the recovery, you, can't, you don't look at one month and it, that's not a snapshot in time. You look over a period of time in the last three months in this country, we've We've added an average of 750,000 jobs to our economy every month. We still have a ways to go. I think you also, in your intro, you talked about you know what's what's at stake here. I quite honestly think two things are at play. I think one is uh, people fear, fearful of their health. Uh, and a lot of people haven't come back into the economy because of that. And two, lack of child care. And the fact that school started this week and last week and next week, I think we'll start to see a lot more people come back into the job market because there'll be this strong child care with having our schools open. But there are a lot of jobs that are offering more money so people can afford more child care. In fact, I've actually seen jobs advertised with child care included. So we're not ignoring the fact that the pandemic played a part, but there are some other factors too. Do you believe that workers might actually be making more money not going back to work and actually enjoy the comforts of that enhanced unemployment benefit? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I would, and I wouldn't say it's comforts. I think anyone who's unemployed or collecting unemployment insurance, uh, they want to be back at work because there's going to be a time where it ends. The the additional $300 unemployment extension ends on Monday. Uh, it is over Monday. Uh, and I think a lot of people would rather be at work. And I think that when I talk about child care, it's also access to child care. The child care, uh, a lot of child care industry uh, has been hit hard by the pandemic. Some aren't coming back. Some of the individual child care facilities, the, the, the kind of owner operated ones that they're struggling. So I, again, it's a, it's a whole system. And, and, you know, certainly I would love, you know, as a former mayor, as you said that, you know, I thought, I think about, you know, getting people working, getting people paying, 
you know, real estate, property tax or, or income tax and getting our economy moving forward and moving forward. But, you know, again, like we, we are still living with a pandemic. We're still living within the means of, of the Delta variant. Uh, and we have we have more work to do there. And and, and one of my messages to people today uh, in the region is, is to get vaccinated. You know, this should not be a political issue. The science tells us vaccines are safe. And the science tells us also that people that are vaccinated, we have lower rates of Delta variant, or lower rates of coronavirus. We still have ways to move and, and lots of work to do, but uh, I feel I feel very confident about the future of America, the future of America's workforce, and the future of America's businesses. Well, we'll look forward to the next jobs report. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh, thanks for joining us. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me. And there's more to this story. CEO of staffing website ZipRecruiter saying there are 40% more jobs open today than there were before the pandemic began, and that was already a white hot job market. Two people who know this all too well, small business expert Carol Roth and Slapfish restaurant founder, Chef Andrew Gruel. Thank you so much for both of you joining us. Andrew, let's start with you. How difficult has it been for the restaurant industry, particularly for those who have to find, it, it's hard to find good help in one sense of the word. I guess it's never been more true than now. Certainly. And it's been a roller coaster ride, I got to say. You know, when things opened back up, they came back with reckless abandon and everybody was trying to decide whether they were going to jump back into the labor market or not. So there was that hiccup on the front side of this. Then we dealt with the supply issues, right? And labor and supply are obviously interconnected because this whole entire conversation has a lot, there's a lot of integrations here. And now we're coming back towards the other side of the summer where people are perhaps getting anxious about the Delta variant and their kids going back to school and they're getting anxious again. Do I stay home and watch my kids? Because perhaps the schools could be shut down. We're talking about kids spreading COVID, the Delta variant. There's a lot of anxiety out there. So now what we're starting to see is, is where we peaked kind of midsummer, where we were feeling really confident about the vaccines. And now there's a lot more worry about the Delta variant. The employees aren't necessarily lining up to take those jobs that are available, even if they're paying more money. Even if they're vaccinated. Carol, I have to ask you from a woman's perspective, <laughs> a lot of women are enjoying the fact that they can run their small business out of their house, have their kids close by, though there are moments where they're thinking, why do I have to deal with all of this at once <laughs> under my one roof? But talk to us about the fact that there are a lot of people who are reconsidering what they want to do for work. Yeah, there is much of a great reset in terms of people rethinking how they want to approach work. And certainly we're hearing that flexible work options is something that makes a job very, very attractive, um, sometimes even more so than pay. I think when you're in that cycle of working, you sometimes don't appreciate you know, how great it is to be able to work from home or to have more time with the family. And even though I don't agree with how we got there for a lot of women and men too, that opportunity to be closer to home, to not have the commute, to spend time, more time with the family is definitely something that they're appreciating. And so I think we're going to see not only this mismatch of jobs, um, but it's it just uh, a lot of people really appreciating and valuing as much as increased pay, the ability to be flexible in their work. And some companies can offer that. You can have that hybrid schedule where sometimes you work from home and sometimes you work in the office. One area that is not applicable is the hospitality industry. So Andrew, what do you think is going to be next for people who work in hotels and restaurants? What are we going to have to do collectively to get people back on the job. Well, it's funny you ask that because I'm trying to figure out a way where people can actually cook all of my menu items at home and then distribute from there, but I still <laughs> haven't figured amazing. out the answer. Uh, you know, <laughs> aside from that, Aside from that, look, you know, what you're going to start to see with restaurants and back again in hospitality when we talk about hotels and resorts is you're going to see a scale down of offerings. You're going to start to see limited hours. It's inevitable, right? Um, going into and through the pandemic, you, no room service, no host, housekeeping, um, limited hours through all the operations at hotels. And we'll start to see the same in the restaurant industry, uh, you know, just around the board. You know, Carol, I think about the fact that small business owners everywhere have gotten more creative, more nimble, uh, but there are still a lot of folks who have four hire signs sitting in their windows. And while all of these jobs are available and they're paying very well, people just aren't coming back. And the pandemic is just one reason. Why do you think other people are maybe not getting back to work? Is mental health an issue? Is stress an issue? 
I mean, I certainly think they're all factors. I certainly think the biggest factors, though, is the fact that we've had a lot of stimulus. We've had um, enhanced unemployment benefits, and that's given people a little bit more of a cushion. And as the labor secretary was saying previously, if we don't have confidence in terms of what's going to happen with the school system for people who do have kids, are you going to go into the labor force to only have to leave the labor force to take care of your kids again or homeschool them in another month. Do I think that all of this uncertainty, the fact that we don't have a clear path forward um, and some of the decisions that have been made as the government reaction to the pandemic has made it so that people don't have the ability to confidently go back to the workforce. And I don't think we're going to see it in September. I think that it, it's probably going to be October or November and have Having you know one or two months under their belts of okay the schools stay open uh, unemployment benefits aren't coming back maybe now we're getting back to normal. I want to ask Andrew the same question in regards to what you just said. So unemployment or enhanced unemployment benefits ending this month September. Do you think people are going to get back to work now? And do you think people are going to get back to work because of that holiday crunch time? I don't necessarily think it's the unemployment benefits at this stage that are really affecting the labor numbers. I think in the beginning, perhaps it was a variable, but I do agree with Carol 100%. I think people are going to really see this thing through. I think child care is a huge piece of it, and they want to see what's going to happen with the school systems. And then furthermore, looking at places like Israel and Europe and Australia, are we going to face new shutdowns? And if that's the case, why get off the unemployment benefits if they're only going to get shut down to get back on them and perhaps lose them in general? So, so many variables and unknowns at play here. Yeah, we need more confidence, that's for sure. Thank you so much, Chef Andrew Gruel and Carol Roth, yeah. the author of The War on Small Business. We appreciate you both. Thank All you. right, deep breath now. It's holiday time, and you might be hitting the road or getting on a plane very, very soon, and you know there's going to be a lot of company through about 8.30 p.m. nationwide tonight, according to analytics from Enrix. It's one of the busiest times to get anywhere. News Nation's Brian Enton is out there with us. Of course, he's got to make sure that everybody gets on those flights. And we also have our own Nancy Lou braving the crowds and the traffic. And I bet you you can tell us a little bit about gas prices. But let's start with Brian Enton at Miami's International Airport first. Brian. Adrian, it is busy out here. It has been like nonstop, a constant stream of cars just dropping, tra uh, dropping travelers off going all over the country. There's this new phrase out there called revenge travel. It's basically people who have been cooped up. They don't like the lockdowns. They don't like the restrictions, and they are ready to get out and go, and we've been talking to them all day long. Take a look at this. This is interesting. TripAdvisor put out their list of the top five cities that people uh, are traveling this Labor Day. Ocean City, Orlando, Las Vegas, Myrtle Beach, and New York City. That's where people are on their way to uh, throughout the country. Outdoor uh, activities very, very popular because of COVID. We're told that national parks are expected to be uh, very, very busy. And even more than air travel, uh, people are hitting the roads. There's more people that are going to be driving to destinations. Nancy Liu is live in Los Angeles. Nancy, the gas prices, though, they're insane right now. Absolutely eye popping. Check this out. We're on the west side of LA. Yes, it is $5.80 a gallon for regular, $6 for premium. Californians are paying the highest prices ever for Labor Day gas. And it's not just Californians paying more, drivers everywhere paying more. According to AAA, the average price for regular in the country right now, 318 a gallon. This is almost a dollar more than last year. And California's average jumped by over a dollar. It is $4.40 a gallon. Of course, that is an average, so you will see prices like this, $6 a gallon. And Adrian, as you can imagine, this will have a ripple effect on spending because people spending more on gas, they're going to spend less on hotels and restaurants and souvenirs and gifts. So definitely a ripple effect from these high gas prices. Oh, they're going to look for a deal, that's for sure. Nancy Liu in Los Angeles, Brian Inton in Miami, thank you both. Be safe this holiday weekend. We'll see you soon. President Biden is in New Orleans today, traveling there as healer in chief. Can that help his sagging poll numbers? That's coming up. Plus, the Democrats are divided over the $3.5 trillion spending plan. One senator not on board. 
and Bernie Sanders and the far left are not happy about it. Don't forget to follow us on social media at the Donlin Report on Twitter. The United States war in Afghanistan is finally over. The last U.S. troops left Bagram Air Base in Kabul Tuesday, ending America's longest war. But Americans remain in Afghanistan, wanting to get out. And after 13 Marines were killed in an attack last week, many Americans are infuriated, saddened, and on edge. New poll numbers from NPR had the president's approval rating at 43 percent. That's a 6 six percent drop from last month. The poll cited softening support among both Democrats and independents. Add in a disappointing jobs report, continued coronavirus concerns. Could things be getting even more difficult for the White House? For more, we are joined by Julia Manchester of The Hill and Sarah Westwood of The Washington Examiner. Ladies, thank you for joining with us. Let's begin with you, Julia. The president has taken a big hit for his handling of the Afghanistan pullout, even from Democrats. We have those 13 American Marines who died. How much of this will impact the rest of his term? Well, it could impact the rest of his term in a huge way. Look, we know that right now his poll numbers are dropping, and this has given Republicans really a huge opportunity to attack him, to attack him on the issue of foreign policy and on the issue of national security. And in terms from a public relations standpoint, I mean, you see these awful images coming out of Kabul, whether it was that evacuation from Kabul airport or um, those Americans that were left behind going to the Taliban, uh, seizing control of Kabul and the rest of Afghanistan. So not a good look for Joe Biden. However, it's hard to tell what will happen between now and the end of his term. Um, in terms of uh, the upcoming midterms, we know that Republicans, at least the Republican sources I've talked to, have said yes in the moment. They're focusing on Afghanistan. But other issues like the economy are likely to play a bigger role ultimately at the ballot box. And I know we're going to be talking about the economy, but Sarah, I have to ask, what do you think? Because, I mean, a lot of people would argue that uh, Joe Biden was elected because he was the lesser evil. But what will the results be around the midterms? Well, I think voters don't typically go to the polls to vote on foreign policy issues. And by the time we get to November 2022, for all we know, the chaos that we saw in Kabul could really be a distant memory. But where I do think this could impact Joe Biden pretty significantly is that it really erodes that perception of competency, of empathy that put Biden in the White House. He rode a wave of independents and centrists, some who typically do vote Republican because he's sold himself as someone who is well-versed in governing, someone who could be the steady hand on the wheel. And what Afghanistan did was really puncture that bubble. I mean, really, Joe Biden uh, is seen as having handled that pretty incompetently. That's why you do see the precipitous slide in his poll numbers right now. And now voters could be looking at everything he does from here on out through a lens of incompetency of failure and so everything he does from here on out won't be viewed with the same benefit of the doubt that was afforded to him before if voters start to see his administration as disorganized that could be what lasts into the midterm this perception that he doesn't understand what's going on now you did start to see his poll numbers start to slide before afghanistan happened that decline began happening around june that was because covid cases were coming back the honeymoon period for him was really over seven months into his presidency but afghanistan really brought that decline much more quickly than it might have otherwise happened the president's approval rating usually is the biggest indicator of how a party's going to perform in the midterm. So Democrats certainly looking at these numbers and potentially starting to get a little worried right now. Well, Sarah, you mentioned his compassion and his empathy visiting Louisiana, of course, following uh, the massive damage done in New Orleans. So we're seeing some of that empathy right now in action. Uh, but the White House is hoping to change the topic from Afghanistan over to another topic, though a house divided will not stand, as the old adage goes, and uh, fellow Democrats are really at odds over spending. Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, a self-described Democratic socialist who heads up the budget committee, wants to spend a $3.5 trillion budget plan. Senator Joe Manchin, who previously embraced the plan, is now asking for a, quote, pause. He comes from West Virginia much redder state. Julia, what happens now? Because progressive Democrats are not happy at all. 
progressive Democrats aren't happy at all. This makes it even more difficult to the, for the White House to try to wade through this issue. Look, Joe Biden really needs a win right now. Democrats need a win right now. It's been a rough week for the president and the leader of the Democratic Party, whether it's Afghanistan, um, the natural disasters we've seen with Hurricane Ida, um, the dis abysmal job numbers we saw today. They need a win. And now you're seeing more, I guess, intra-party tension within the Democratic Party. You know, we seen throughout the summer this tension really um, start to come to a head, whether it's on Capitol Hill and those infrastructure deals or whether it's on the campaign trail and these Democratic primaries where you see the progressive and the centrist really going head to head. So I think right now this has got to be very frustrating for Joe Biden, but also for progressive Democrats. Progressive Democrats are very much trying to get this deal through. Um, they weren't happy with the initial uh, infrastructure bill that was passed. So this is what they're hanging on to. And I think uh, Joe Manchin, once again, is becoming a villain for a lot of progressive Democrats. Sarah, what are your thoughts? I mean, Manchin saying enough money, enough trillions have been spent, so it may be hard to win him back. Well, I think Joe Manchin tends to be a pretty easy target for Democrats taking heat for coming out against positions that really multiple centrist Democrats are uncomfortable with. He is not the only Democrat to express discomfort with that $3.5 trillion top line number on the reconciliation bill, but he's not up for reelection for another five years. He is someone who has bipartisanship sort of built into his brand in a way that other congressional Democrats don't. Other Democrats might risk some sort of progressive uh, revolt back home if they were to come out against something like this, but they are more than happy to hide behind Senators Manchin's opposition with things they're uncomfortable with. You're seeing that, for example, with the filibuster. Manchin is often blamed uh, for being the primary obstacle for changing filibuster rules in the Senate, but there are multiple Democrats in the Senate who are also uncomfortable with doing that. And you saw in the House a handful of moderates, and not to sink any piece of legislation that Speaker Pelosi wants to pass, did not want to pass the $3.5 trillion reconciliation package until movement was made on the bipartisan deal, infrastructure deal. And so that's what I'll be watching is to see if the negotiations take a lot longer than they were expected to, and they drag on past that September 27th deadline that Pelosi promised the moderates that they would vote on the bipartisan infrastructure package by that date. Is she going to go back on her word to the moderates? Is she going to try to put that bipartisan infrastructure bill on the floor and perhaps risk progressives not voting for it as they said they won't if the bigger spending package hasn't moved? So there are a lot of moving pieces here. And Manchin's opposition, he's not the only one opposed, but certainly complicates the path ahead. Julia Manchester of The Hill, Sarah Westwood of The Washington Examiner, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Up next, an ISIS-inspired attack in New Zealand a week after the ISIS suicide bombing in Kabul. Is this the start of a new trend in terror? Plus, 9-11 families demanding answers from President Biden will get them. We'll speak to one of those family members coming up. A terrifying incident out of Auckland, New Zealand, leaving several victims fighting for their lives after a man stabbed them in a supermarket. New Zealand police shot and killed the knife-wielding man. He stabbed six people. Reportedly, he was inspired by ISIS ideology, and the incident is being characterized as a terrorist attack. So here's the question. Is there a reason to be concerned about the possibility of similar attacks here in the U.S.? Joining us now to help answer this question, former security intelligence and counterterrorism operative Mubin Sheikh. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. So a lot of people are wondering, let's just get it out there. Is there reason to fear an attack just like this in the U.S.? Well, with the anniversary of 9-11 coming up, a lot of these groups uh, and supporters of these groups do see an opportunity uh, whether they take that opportunity or not, unfortunately, we're going to see. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time, uh, of course, because of the victory of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, Islamists everywhere are seeing this as wind in their sails. And so whether or not this will be, you know, uh, enough wind to launch attacks, uh, unfortunately, we may learn the hard way. Well, let's talk about the New Zealand uh, case specifically. Authorities say the man was inspired by ISIS ideology. He could have been a lone wolf. He watched some videos online. Is there any reason to believe that ISIS actually helped to organize this attack? 
No, uh, I don't think uh, there would be any direct link, meaning uh, ISIS central per se. I mean, if there is an ISIS central, there is, but they encourage autonomous attacks anyway. Uh, ISIS has been putting out this kind of propaganda to conduct even knife attacks uh, in their magazines and in their propaganda that they've been releasing really since 2014. Uh, for those who remember, in 2014, ISIS declared its so-called caliphate, and that's when we started to see the uptick of attacks uh, by 2015, we saw the Paris attacks, and then, you know, it continued into 2017 and 18. Uh, it kind of dropped down a little bit, but uh, are we about to see a rise in ISIS attacks? That is a good question. Okay, well, let's go a little deeper now, because you personally have experience with this sort of radicalized ideology. So the question is, how do we actually prevent what is happening again. I remember the beheadings. I remember the caliphate making headlines all over the world. How do we prevent individuals or groups from actually taking that radicalized uh, ideology and, and making it a part of their own mi mission inside of culture here in the US and in Europe? Yeah, it's very difficult to answer that because uh, I mean, unless you're arresting them and putting them in a prison cell, uh, how else are you gonna stop them? Unfortunately, in this case, uh, there, there seems to be, uh, you know, some pretty major mistakes. For example, uh, he was sentenced to one year of supervision uh, because they feared that he might conduct a lone wolf knife attack. And shockingly, in I guess according to the judge in New Zealand, uh, preparing a terrorist attack is not currently a criminal offense. Uh, so he was actually released from prison, and there was surveillance all over him. Now the guy was surveillance conscious. He was looking to see, you know, if there were people following him. And if you're on a surveillance team and the guy is looking to see if he's being followed, you can't be too close to the person. So what did he do? He went into a store, bought a knife, and then just went on his stabbing rampage. Uh, luckily, and thank God that within a minute of the police arriving, they shot him dead. And that's unfortunately the only way to guarantee that they won't be a threat. Well, you bring up the good point. Uh, we have to pay attention to red flags. And if history is any indication, there have been warnings before that have sometimes been ignored, unfortunately. Uh, thank you so much, former security intelligence and counterterrorism operative Mubin Sheikh. Up next, President Biden calling for the declassification and review of classified information on the 9-11 terrorist attacks in response to a years-long dispute over those documents. Joining us now with her response to the move, Terry Strada with 9-11 Families and Survivors United for Justice Against Terrorism. Terry, we've had you on before. Last time you were discussing the fact that many families of 9-11 victims, they didn't want Biden to attend the memorial for the 20th anniversary of 9-11 because those documents have yet to be released. So what are the families saying now that some of those documents will be declassified? Well, I think we're all very excited and thrilled with this prospect of seeing these documents. And the real test will begin next week when they start to do the review of this 2016 um, summary. And we'll see how cooperative they're going to be. And we're going to learn a lot. Well, what, what do you hope to learn? I know that there's the connection to Saudi Arabia that a lot of the families have been talking about in, in regards to the day and the events of 9-11, but what kind of closure are you seeking? Well, we won't have closure until this entire review process takes place, and it's going to take months before it is in its entirety. Um, we're hoping to learn as much as we possibly can about the connections between the kingdom and the hijackers. We know that they had agents here that were on the kingdom's payroll um, sent here to meet and greet the hijackers and provide them with their housing and their, their um, bank accounts, their flight lessons, all of that. So we know that this investigation took place for nine and a half years post the 9-11 Commission, post the joint inquiry, and there's just going to be a lot more information about the kingdom and the role that they played in not only financing, but aiding and abetting the 19 hijackers. Why do you think President Biden is now deciding to do this after so long? Well, on August 5th, we stood in front of the Capitol and we introduced the um, 9-11 Transparency Act, Senator Menendez is our strong, strong, staunch supporter in this. And I do believe strongly that that introduction of that act is what um, what started this entire, you know, ball rolling that the president, the White House said, wow, there's legislation that's coming down the pipeline that will force this mandate. 
and we can probably get ahead of it and do something positive before the 11th for the families. And I think that's really what started all of it. I'm sure you're looking forward to that day in order to pay tribute to them, correct? Yes, very much so. All right. Well, we wish you and your family and all of the 9-11 families and survivors uh, a great deal of comfort during this uh, very important anniversary, the 20th year. Terry Strada, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. We got to shift gears now to another threat facing us as we head into the holiday weekend, cybersecurity. Security officials having the FBI, or rather including the FBI, have issued an alert about a possible hack citing the recent cyber attacks that took place over other holiday weekends. Mother's Day weekend, the Colonial Pipeline was hacked, leaving gas shortages up and down the East Coast. Memorial Day weekend, meat producer JBS was targeted in a ransomware attack that threatened the U.S. meat supply. Fourth of July weekend, a ransomware attack on Casilla impacted as many as 1,500 companies. Joining us right now, one of our regulars for cybersecurity, Scott Schober, president and CEO of Berkeley Veritronics. Thank you so much, Scott, for joining us. So. Is the answer to uh, why this is happening on a holiday weekend as obvious as uh, most of us might think? Uh, yeah, I think it is. There's some some really clear tells, and I'm so glad that that, that the FBI and Department of Homeland Security, uh, the cyber arm, that they actually put out this alert because it's really important. As you mentioned there, the other holiday weekends, there was a lot of activity, a lot of ransomware attacks, and we probably will see it again. So they're really being proactive, preparing people. And, and if you wonder why, think about it. A holiday weekend, it's less staff. There's less people there to main the IT systems, the network, and that is really dangerous. That gives the cyber criminals time, time to move in and guess passwords, usernames, extend to, to reach more and more devices and computers that they want to hack into. It gives them plenty of a time and plenty of attack surface. Therefore, I think it's very important that they put this alert out and that companies respect it and have the manpower on so they can respond. Big companies obviously uh, really watching, but every single one of us is looking at our phones thinking, is there something we need to do individually our direct pay accounts, our bank accounts, our identities. Is there anything we need to do this weekend to protect ourselves? Yeah, we, we all should just be on high alert, especially look out for anything that might be suspicious. One of the most effective ways, especially ransomware attacks are launched, is from phishing emails where they're trying to lure us in to click on an attachment. So anything looks suspicious, stop. Do not click on it. Very, very important. Very basic, but very important because you could trace these attacks back to somebody just simply clicking on a link. So that's just good, proper cyber hygiene we all should really employ. One more question for you, Scott. We talked a lot about terrorism today. Would you say that cyber attacks are the most, I guess, pervasive form of terrorism right now? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like in a sense, we're in a cyber war. That's what's so scary. Uh, these cyber criminals, they're sitting in their basement. They don't see those that are affected by this. Unfortunately, we read it in the headlines. We learn about it from news organizations, but they don't see the victims. And it makes it easier for them to stay anonymous, stay disconnected, and continue to make a lot of money. These cyber attacks are very successful, so they're going to continue on until we can get a more secure stance. Yeah, they don't see us and we don't see them. It's a faceless battle. And it is extremely concerning. Scott Schober, president and CEO of Berkeley Veritronics, thanks for being with us. Well, thanks for having me. Well, students in Colorado, they left school because they don't want to wear masks anymore. We'll hear from some of them coming up. And we're taking a deep dive into another epidemic affecting America, the opioid crisis, and why a lot of families are not happy with the recent settlement against the makers of OxyContin. It was a week of protests for a few schools in Douglas County, Colorado, just outside of Denver. KCNC-TV in Denver says students are calling for an end to the mask mandate the district put in place as a precaution against the Delta variant. Now, some the of the loudest of voices school. were heard at Thunder Ridge High School. High school career. If you are scared, I was, you can I stay we home. Here. These people agree with me. They hate masks, and I do too. 
walking out of class around 9.30 on Wednesday morning demanding an end to the masks in class, saying that they've had enough. But here's the deal. The district says kids will have to deal with the masks through the end of the year. Now to the opioid epidemic, which killed over 500,000 Americans and drove the makers of OxyContin into bankruptcy. On Wednesday, a federal judge approved a settlement deal to dissolve Purdue Pharma. The plan also protects what some call the most evil family in America from any civil liability. Now, under the plan, the Sackler family uh, would forfeit ownership of Purdue Pharma, turning over more than 30 million documents, paying $4.5 billion. In exchange, the family is protected from any future civil litigation. And we got to talk about this because a lot of people are upset. Activists, uh, those who've had family members pass away because of the, um, of course, this public health crisis, which it's been deemed. Joining us now is opioid and pain management expert, Dr. Paul Christo, and president of To End the Stigma, a nonprofit mm -hmm. created to help people struggling with substance abuse disorder, Jill Chikowitz. Thank you so much and welcome to the show. Jill, I want to start with you. Uh, Purdue Pharma will now become a charity, in essence, funneling profits into government programs to fight addiction. The Sackler family will not be involved in this. What do you think about this uh, decision? I mean, first and foremost, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I, I don't envy Judge Drain's decision and his position. Uh, I think it was a very hard position, but I will tell you the decision, uh, it left a bad taste in our mouths. We feel like the victims got the shortest end of the stick, and that is putting it mildly. Um, it's disgusting what we've done to these victims, and just putting them uh, last is has been painful for my family and for many that we represent. You know, um, there are headlines all over the place. Uh, the worst drug dealers in history getting away with billions, says one headline. Um, mm -hmm. There's a bankruptcy loophole that protects their finances, at least their le the family's finances. Um, and, and a lot of folks have pointed to the fact that they cannot be criminally charged, and they have never been criminally charged. In fact, uh, the family has not apologized. They don't believe that they have done anything wrong. So Dr. Christo, many people have loved ones whose lives have been forever changed by opioid addiction. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? Well, you know, I, I think that we certainly have evidence that from the 1990s and then beyond that, that Purdue Pharma, even other opioid manufacturers, were engaged in you know, misleading efforts with respect to the, their products, their opioid products. Uh, and I think that they were, you know, they had a sales force that was encouraging the use of opioids, OxyContin in this case, with respect to Purdue Pharma, uh, on the part of physicians and healthcare providers. So they provided information about the benefits, but really withheld information with respect to the detriment, namely abuse or misuse or even addiction and death. And Jill, that's something that we're all like hearing so many headlines about. This is not the only company or the only name in the game of the opioid crisis. What has been the collective response around those who either have family members who've struggled with this particular substance abuse or have lost loved ones in this fight? So I serve on a pretty pharma ad hoc victims committee. And I will tell you all the families, I mean, we're crushed. This week was like losing our loved ones once again. This family, the Sackler family, um, they have blood on their hands. They're living a lavish lifestyle based off of the benefits and the proceeds of this drug that they intentionally marketed. It's pure disgusting. And honestly, I don't know how they look at themselves in the mirror, but that's something they'll have to deal with for the rest of their lives. But Jill, I think a lot of people, and, and including victims, have been quoted in many different articles online that had it not been for this legal decision, there could have been years and thousands of lawsuits and it would have become legal chaos. Are, are they happy at all with any part of this decision? Well, I will tell you, you know, um, I, I'm personally involved with my twin brother's death in this. And I will say, if we had gone to litigation, it would have tied up the money for years. Um, it would have drained all the monies that the victims would have received. So it, in the end, it was the best decision. Was it enough? Is it the best deal that we wanted? No, but it is the best deal that we felt like we did for the victims. All right. Opioid and pain management expert, Dr. Paul Christo, and president of To End the Stigma, Jill Chikowitz. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have you been eating your veggies? The CEO of healthy food restaurant chain Sweet Greens getting grilled this week for suggesting obesity is a root cause of some of the health problems during the pandemic. Jonathan Neiman writing in a social media post that 78% of hospitalizations due to COVID are obese and overweight people. 
Is there an underlying pro problem, he writes, that perhaps we've not given enough attention to? A user of the site commented that it was an incredibly fat phobic post. We're joined by Rick Green, former Texas State Representative and Patriot Academy founder, to talk about this and so many more hot topics. So, Rick, Neiman took that post down. The backlash was strong, but there are a lot of sides to this. First, the CDC has paired obesity and other comorbidities to uh, COVID. So, is that at least somewhat right? Yeah, hey, Adrian, good to be with you. Listen, I don't agree with everything he said because he was for some other mandates, which there's no actual constitutional authority for any of these mandates from the government, but absolutely agree with him that we should be talking about what you're talking about. All of the science should matter. We should look at the data. I mean, when you look at it and say nearly 80% of hospitalizations with COVID have something in common, it just makes sense for us to talk about what that thing in common was. Why is Japan's death rate half of ours, even though their cases have gone up 1,500% in the last two months? Because we're 8.5 times more obese than Japan. These things matter in a robust exchange of ideas. I mean, all these people attacking him for even bringing up the concept. And that robust exchange of ideas is not only needed for the health of our constitutional republic, it's frankly needed for our own health. We need to debate these things to get to the right answers for all Americans. Yeah, I think he got into some murky water when he is uh, saying that we should tax processed foods. And considering he makes salads, right. that was kind of tricky. Um, real quick, COVID, Chicago's uh, health uh, officials saying that if you're unvaccinated, you have to get tested before you travel, then tested after you travel, then quarantined for seven days. What do you think about that? I think it's insanity. Listen, we've never quarantined the healthy in the history of our nation or, frankly, mankind. Uh, we started some some bad uh, policies last year in the stay-at-home orders for people that were healthy, and this is kind of in that same mindset. And it also ignores the science. I mean, completely ignores the science. I've had COVID, had a pretty bad case of it. So according to this Israeli study, I've got 13 times the protection of someone that's vaccinated, yet they want to quarantine me and not the person that's vaccinated, who, according to that same study in Israel, says is 27 times more likely to spread the virus than I am, which has to do with mucosal immunity, which I have from having the virus, and internal immunity, which people that have the vaccine have, but they don't have the mucosal immunity. So it's just, it's just anti-science. It's literally ignoring the data. One more question. We only have about 45 seconds. New York City rethinking the idea of the honor roll system. They want to get rid of that, saying it's detrimental to some students, partially in large part because of COVID-19. And they're actually saying that if you're late, you won't get penalized. If you have lesser grades, you will be able to have a do-over. What do you think about it? It's the same bad idea that's from a combination of this Marxist egalitarian idea of making people equal and also that we're doing it because of the feelings of those who aren't on the honor roll. We need competition. We need to challenge people. This encourages mediocrity and failure instead of encouraging hard work. Why does a Conor McGregor with hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank still want to be in the octagon and fight? Because he wants to live and not just exist. That's the kind of attitude we ought to be encouraging. So if they're going to get rid of the honor roll, Maybe we replace it with some Brazilian jiu-jitsu lessons or UFC fight pass. Rick Green from the Patriot Academy. Thank you for being with us. we got to go to break. Thanks, we'll be Adrian. right back. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Our American snapshot tonight. Are we supposed to do that right now? Yeah, I think so. Are we doing our American snapshot? A tribute to the power of the American spirit. We're going to have that for you right next. Disaster and tragedy can give us perspective and bring us home to what is most important. This week, Hurricane Ida left a trail of destruction in the Deep South, stretching all the way to the Northeast. Today, President Biden visited storm-ravaged Louisiana, talking with neighbors and comforting victims who lost everything. Nearly a million remain without power in the South. Ida was the fifth most powerful storm to hit the U.S. It killed at least 63 people across eight states. We've seen some amazing and heart-wrenching images coming out this week. The images that capture our attention most are those that depict the will to survive against even the harshest conditions. That's our American snapshot tonight, those pictures of hope. And with that, we wish you a safe and happy Labor Day holiday weekend. Please enjoy it with someone you love. On Balance with Leland Vitter, next.